those of us from the U.S. have some weird ideas, I think, about monarchies. We think kings and queens and princesses and princes are pretty cool, but mostly it's because they're rich and famous and we are stuck on celebrity. We love rich and famous. I know that I stayed up late or woke up early or something to watch the royal wedding back in 1981. Remember Lady Di marrying Prince Charles? It was a huge event all over the world and we Americans were glued to the screen. But monarchy? That's kind of different. That would come as a surprise to our Canadian friends. Did you know Americans, of course the Canadians know, did you know that the Canadian Constitution says that the executive government and authority of and over Canada is vested in the Queen of England? She lends all that power to the Prime Minister, but still, kind of strange. According to polls, about half of Canadians think that it's time to declare their independence. And if I may make a suggestion, July 4 would be awesome. We can make it a whole North American party. July 4, 2026, 250 years after 1776. Perfect. Well, kings and queens may have a severely reduced role in the world in the 21st century, but national leadership is more important than ever. Don't worry, I'm not going to get into national politics here except for my suggestion to the Canadians that they, you know, declare their independence. Uh, <laughs> but I think that we can agree that our political leaders have a tremendous impact on our daily lives, from our sense of personal and national security to our economic well-being to the whole ecology of the world. And our psalm this morning is about the King of Israel and his role. Psalm 72 is a royal psalm. It's one of many psalms written for the king and probably for his coronation. <coughs> Excuse me. This psalm asks God for his blessing on the king and on his people. And it tells us what good government really ought to be and ought to do. And, spoiler alert, it's also a messianic psalm. It tells us what we can hope for when God's Messiah reigns on earth. I'm going to read Psalm 72 right now. <coughs> Excuse me. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba prevent, present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted, who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live, may gold from Sheba be given to him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. May grain abound throughout the land, on top of the hills may it sway. May the crops flourish like Lebanon and thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Then all nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed. Psalm 72 is credited to or for Solomon. Did David write it for Solomon, or did Solomon write it for himself, or for his son Rehoboam who succeeded him? I have no idea. But it does demonstrate that when the 
king is crowned, it's a moment of tremendous hope for the people. Things are bound to change with a new king. Will he be a good king? Will he be better than his predecessor? Will he reign for a long time and provide us with stability? Will he be successful against our enemies? Will he help us maintain peace and prosperity? This sum was likely used in an annual celebration of the king, so it served as a reminder to him and to the people of what was expected and hoped for him. So how a king should rule, that's what this psalm is about. The first thing, the most basic thing, is that we want justice and righteousness from our rulers. And the fruit of righteousness will be prosperity. The first three verses, endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to, to the people, the hills, the fruit of righteousness. The king is supposed to be fair. Of course, he shouldn't show his partiality to his cronies or his nobles or to the wealthy. It should be, in fact, the opposite. The king ought to be on the side of the poor, the afflicted, the oppressed. Justice is the standard by which Israelite monarchs were to be measured, not by their military prowess or by their building projects like in Egypt or in Babylonia or Assyria. The Israelite monarchy was to be judged by how it looked after the powerless. The powerful can take care of themselves in any society. That means what makes a king's government stand out is how it cares for the unfortunate. The king's justice is not merely to respond where legal counsel is called for, it's to actively save. He's not just a judge, he's a savior. Listen to verse four. May he defend the afflicted among the people. May he save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. According to the theology of this psalm, you gain power not by grasping for the most, but by caring for the least. The next section of this poem expands on that peace and prosperity, the shalom, as we say in Hebrew, that this kind of rule brings. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his day may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. Now most of us were not or are not farmers like the ancient Israelites. They knew exactly how much we all depend on the rain. But at the beginning of this rainy season, isn't it wonderful to look out and see the green of the hills, to notice how all the dust has fallen out of the air? It's great. I can breathe again. We smell it. It smells delicious, like a new mown field. The psalm says that a king who rules with justice and righteousness will have an, a healing impact on the land. Healing. It makes sense, though, doesn't it? If the oppressed, the poor, are treated well, if they don't have to do things like um, clear-cut trees or over-farm, that will heal the land. And when the rich are treated with righteousness, they won't be able to exploit the land with impunity just to enrich themselves. When we prosper, we have peace. And we want it to last, right? So when we have a righteous king, it makes sense to ask that he endure as long as the sun or as long as the moon through all generations. God bless the king so that he may reign with justice and mercy and his peace and prosperity may it abound until the moon is no more. Well then, in verse 8, the psalm makes kind of a turn from how the king and his people relate to each other to how the king relates to the rest of the nations. And we learn that by ignoring power politics, he, surprisingly, gains international reputation and influence. Let me read. Verse 8, may he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. 
May the kings of Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. Wow. Talk about an empire. This describes the whole known world at this time. You probably know that the closest Israel ever came to this was when Solomon ruled. He built a bunch of trade relationships with neighboring countries, and um, he had treaties with all sorts of neighbors, and Israel, and he prospered from it. The Queen of Sheba did visit him and did bring him gifts. She was impressed by him. Solomon, of course, is the one who built the Temple of Jerusalem. Israel had an era of peace and prosperity with Solomon, but the kingdom split in two right after he was, um, when he was succeeded by Rehoboam, his son. So does that mean the prayers of this psalm weren't answered? Was it all, what, wishful thinking? Rhetorical question, Carolyn. Of course not. I already told you in my spoiler alert at the beginning <laughs> that this psalm isn't just about David or Solomon or any of the kings of Israel. It's also about the Messiah, our King, Jesus. We learn from the psalm how Jesus will rule. Perhaps without even realizing it, in this prayer, Solomon looked forward to the eternal, perfect reign of Christ. All throughout Jesus' ministry on earth, he preached that the kingdom of God was near. The kingdom of God was at hand. The kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus is our king. He proclaimed that the kingdom of God has come with power. We Christians believe that Jesus rules right now, and he will come again in majesty to rule completely, bringing together the new heavens and the new earth. Let me read the next few verses and keep that idea of Jesus in your mind while I do. Verse 12, for he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Isn't that a description of how Jesus worked on this earth? He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He raised the dead. He fed hung thousands of hungry people. He was a friend of prostitutes and sinners and even tax collectors. He knew them and he rescued them. He wept. He wept at the tomb of Lazarus. He had compassion. The word rescue that's used in verse 14, he will rescue them from oppression and violence. That's the same word as the word redeem. And we know Jesus is our redeemer. In Old Testament times, according to Leviticus 25.25, 25, if a person falls into poverty and has to sell his property, a relative was to redeem him from his debt. It says, if one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem what they have sold. For those who had no family or their family couldn't help, God himself becomes their redeemer. And that's in Jeremiah 50, 33 and 34. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The people of Israel are oppressed and the people of Judah as well. All their captors hold them fast, refusing to let them go. Yet their redeemer is strong. The Lord Almighty is his name. He will vigorously defend their cause so that he may bring rest to their land, but unrest to those who live in Babylon. In Psalm 72, the king, not a relative, is to be redeemer for his people. And this is exactly who Jesus is for us. He is our redeemer, the one who pays our hopeless debts for us and relieves us from our oppression. Continuing in verse 15, Long may he live, may gold from Sheba be given him, may people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. And in verse 15, it reflects back to verses 10 and 11, where it says, may the kings of Sheba and Seba present him gifts, may all kings bow down to him and all nations serve, us, serve him. This reminds us of the visit of the Magi to Jesus, 
when that was recorded in Matthew, when they gave him gold and frankincense and myrrh and bowed down to him. So this psalm could even be said to be prophetic. Going on, verse 16, May grain abound throughout the land, on top of the hills may it sway. May the crops flourish like Lebanon and thrive like the grass of the field. Again, when Jesus reigns with justice and righteousness, all creation, even the plants, the crops, will be redeemed. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Now, when this was written, perhaps the thought was, may David's name endure forever. Uh, the house of David, you know, if, if um, the continuation of all the sons of David continued to be king, his name would be remembered forever. And God did promise that to David. But in every other psalm, it's the name of God that's the focus of praise. The king has appeared in other psalms, but his name, the king's name, is never the object of praise until this psalm, Psalm 72. And we know from Philippians 2, 9 and 10, that God exalted him, that's Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Jesus is the king from David's line, whose name is above every name. That's who this psalm is ultimately about. Then all nations will be blessed through him and they will call him blessed. And that's the promise that God made to Abraham. Back in Genesis 12, 2 and 3, he says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. In this psalm, the king will so rule that the reign of God will be extended to the whole earth, and the earth will respond with abundance. The king will be the source of blessing, not only for Israel, but for all the nations of the earth. This king provides the resolution to the age-old division that separates nation from nation and humanity from God. This king will usher in the blessing of Israel and of all the families of the earth that was promised to Abraham. And that is God's intention for humanity fulfilled through Jesus. You may be thinking, well, that's cool, Carolyn, but what does it mean for me in the here and now? And I'm so glad you asked. Let's talk about how we are called to rule. Wait a minute. What? I'm no king, and you just said Jesus was in charge. Yeah, I know. I'm holding both sides of the conversation here, and if I'm wrong, go ahead and tell me in the comments. But I get it. Let's start with our leaders. Can we measure our own political leaders against this call to righteous rule in Psalm 72? Our national leadership, no matter which nation we're in, is far different from the nation of Israel 3,000 years ago. Back then, Israel was both a monarchy and a theocracy. God ultimately was in charge. Their kings were seen as representatives of God. The right of leadership could be removed at any point if they were disobedient and just ask their very first king, Saul, how that worked out. God calls us, this psalm calls us, not only to pray for the well-being of our leaders, but for their wisdom to see that they do do justice, ultimately God's justice. And that righteousness isn't measured by what works, by pragmatics, but by the character of God. He's the one who empowers leaders and who will ultimately set everything right from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth, as this psalm says. But there's more to it than just praying, praying for our leaders. We are meant to rule as well. When the psalmist says he will rule from sea to sea, the word rule that's the same one that's used in Genesis to talk about what humanity's job is here on earth in creation. It doesn't mean that we dictate exactly what will happen. It means we have authority. God has given mankind authority over creation. And as we all know, mankind has done a pretty 
terrible job of it from the very beginning when we rebel against god we mess things up but when jesus is in charge and we accept his authority things can run beautifully this is the place where we are right now in god's plan god is the creator who put us in charge of his creation we messed up we missed the mark he called abraham and his descendants to show us to show the whole world what he really meant for us to be well israel messed up too and missed the mark but they did learn to worship the one true god and then he sent his son jesus who died who rose again and ushered in god's kingdom at his resurrection jesus is the one who will truly set things right he is the coming king and our mission right now is to do our best to build his kingdom so that when he brings heaven and earth together at the final trumpet we'll be ready to rule it as his followers that's our hope that's our expectation that's our mission this psalm describes what will happen when god when jesus the king when nature when all classes of society and foreign nations all live together in harmony. Justice and righteousness will prevail. The earth will heal. Prosperity will follow. Right now, our job is to work for justice and righteousness, to deliver the needy who cry out and the afflicted who have no one to help. We are to take pity on the weak and the needy and rescue them from oppression and violence, including the horrible sin of racism that we've all participated in. We're to use our authority over nature as stewards of God's gift, not exploiters of the resources that he's provided. It's a wonderful calling and mission, and it's all very, very good news. Amen.